The Italians are sat in Sidi Barani, Egypt, and they vastly outnumber the British. This is a problem that the Long Range Desert Group has tried to overcome in the last few months. They've done well so far, and as a reward, they've just been granted permission to double their ranks. But then, at the same moment, New Zealand General Freyberg orders all his men back from the British unit, causing a manpower shortage. Then, at the worst possible moment, the Long Range Desert Group suffers catastrophe. Bagnold wants to mount an attack against Mazuk, a heavily defended Italian fort, which has its own airfield. The problem? It's 1,000 miles from Cairo, and far outside the normal range limit of the Long Range Desert Group. Bagnall's solution to this problem is to get supplies off the French in Chad. But the problem with that solution is that nobody knows whose side the French in Chad are on. Whilst some French colonies have announced their support of or against Vichy France, French Chad has remained silent. The British hope that getting the French in Chad under their wing would influence those in Niger province to swap sides from Vichy to theirs. It's also hoped that a victory at Mazuk against the Italians would persuade the local Fresen Libyans, those in the south, to take up arms against the Italians. So in November 1940, Bagnold flies to Chad and meets the commander of the French troops there. Colonel Donano demands to know Bagnold's reasons for being in French territory. Bagnold tells him that he wants petrol, rations and water for his attack on the Italians. Colonel Donano agrees to help the British, on one condition. He wants to go to Mazuk and fly the French flag alongside the British one. Bagnold agrees, and the invitation to support a daring attack on the Italians has brought the French onto their side. However, there is another issue. The Long Range Desert Group has just been given permission by Wavell to double its size. Not only does Bagnold have to recruit more men than he currently has, but he has to replace the New Zealanders he'd recruited previously. New Zealand General Freyberg demands all his men come back to his unit. Wavell disagrees, and a compromise is reached. The New Zealanders will go back to the 2nd New Zealand Division, but only once they've been replaced by British personnel. That doesn't really help Bagnold though, who will somehow have to replace the New Zealanders soon. Starting this replacement process, W Patrol disbands. The remaining men are moved to R and T patrols, and a new G patrol is established. 36 men from the 3rd Battalion Coldstream Guards and 2nd Battalion the Scots Guards, all British, are now led by Captain Crichton Stewart. But then, on December 9th, events in the north cause a crisis for the Long Range Desert Group. General O'Connor leads his attack on City Barani and wipes out the Italian divisions there. Operation Compass has begun. O'Connor's Western Desert Force advances to Bardia, where they mount a siege. This offensive calls for the Long Range Desert Group to change their plans. No longer are they to mount an attack on Mazuk, instead they are to strike behind the Italian lines and cut communications to the front. Luckily, to the relief of many in the group, this operation is cancelled. The crisis is over, and they can finally focus on Mazuk once more. The operation against Mazuk begins on the 27th of December. T and G patrols move from Cairo and reach Tazerbo near Kufra on the 4th of January 1941. They have 76 men on 23 vehicles. Crichton Stewart and his patrol have three days rest as Clayton goes south to meet up with the French. They return with supplies and the French. Colonel Donano, Captain Masu and eight others join their ranks. On the 9th, they approach Mazuk, and by the 11th, they reach the road running to Sabah in the north. Passing a well, they come across a cyclist, who has a bag of mail, and happily take him, his bike, and the bag of post for the ride. And then they advance. As they approach the fort of Mazuk, some Italians come out to greet them, and are sent back under a hail of fire. At this point, the two patrols split up. Clayton's T-Patrol head to the airstrip, 
where they use the many dips and rises in the terrain to weave around and destroy the various enemy positions. Three light bombers are destroyed and the hangar set aflame. Clayton circles the hangar and stares point blank into a machine gun post. A burst of bullets hits various parts of the vehicle and Colonel Donando dies instantly. Another round hits French Captain Masu, who burns his skin with a cigarette to seal the wound. Clayton's machine gun is jammed, but luckily the Italians choose this moment to surrender. At the fort, the garrison is under a hail of machine gun and mortar fire from G Patrol. It's then that the garrison commander returns from lunch in his staff car and is caught out in the open. His car is destroyed by a shell from a Bofors gun. After two hours of fighting, the Italians raise the white flag and come out with their hands up. It's then that the Long Range Desert Group discover that the garrison's commander's wife and two children are also in the car. Two Italians are taken with the Long Range Desert Group, but the rest can't come with them because there isn't enough food or transport. So they're set free, despite protests from the French. After this victory, the Long Range Desert Group withdraw back into the desert. Away from the fort, they bury Donano and one other casualty, Sergeant Hewson, before heading towards the Tebesti Mountains. At the town of Tragon, they come across two Libyan policemen on camels and send them back into town to tell the small fort at the centre to surrender. Or else. A short time later, a crowd leave the western gate, flying banners and beating drums. The mayor and the town elders have come out to surrender in the traditional pheasant manner. Two machine guns, rifles and documents are captured. Moving 20 miles northeast, they come across the village and fort of Um El Araneb. Clayton sends the captured postmaster from Mazuk towards the village to demand their surrender, but he quickly turns around when the Italian machine guns open fire. Clayton decides not to risk fighting the alert garrison of a large fort and so turns south. Bagnold arrives by aircraft on the 20th of January and drives with the rest of the Long Range as a group to Fayer, which they reach on the 24th of January and drop off the French soldiers. With the death of Dornano, Colonel Leclerc takes command of the French military units in Chad. At Fort Lamy, Bagnold and Leclerc discuss the possibility of initiating a joint operation against Kufra, and after some negotiation, Bagnall agrees that Clayton's two patrols should come under Leclerc and be the vanguard of the French column in the attack on Kufra. Clayton leaves Fayer on the 26th of January and arrives at the Jebel Sherif area 60 miles south of Kufra on the 31st of January. They're spotted by enemy aircraft who lead an Italian motor unit to Clayton's position. The unit is part of the Italian Auto Saharan Company, which is similar in concept to the British Long Range Desert Group. They were formed in 1923 for the purpose of patrolling Libya, but without the intent of venturing beyond the borders. They have similar numbers of men and vehicles, but their vehicles are armed with 20mm Breda guns, and they're also able to bring three aircraft to the fight. At 2pm, the Italians attack and quickly gain fire superiority over the British. New Zealander Rex Breach fires his vehicles, even though his vehicle is hit and abandoned by the others. He gives his comrades time to escape though, continuing to fire until he's finally cut down. Another truck, commanded by New Zealander Ronald Moore, is hit and knocked out. Clayton orders his men to withdraw and head south. However, being the last truck, he's swarmed by Italian aircraft and brought to a halt. Blood pours from Clayton's head as he and another comrade attempt to repair the vehicle. A third comrade keeps their Vickers firing, scoring hits on the Italian planes. Moving another few kilometers with the Italian aircraft shattering their vehicle, they realize it's time to give up when two Italian trucks appear through the dust. The now famous Captain Clayton falls into Italian hands. The remaining patrol withdraws to Sara and then back to Chad. The clerk knows that with such loss, he can no longer take Kufra in the way he'd planned. Therefore, he releases the patrols and allows them to travel home. They reach Cairo on the 9th of February, 1941, having covered 4,500 miles in 45 days. 
But there's one more thing to mention about the battle at Jebel Sharif. The Italians are so delighted to capture Clayton that they fail to capture Moore and his four comrades. Back at his dead truck, Moore yells to the others and asks, shall we go or surrender? To which his men reply, no surrender. The four men flee to the nearby hills, where they're faced with a dilemma. Without food and little water, they can either walk 70 miles to Kufra and surrender to the Italians, or head south and hope to find either the Long Range Desert Group or the Free French. If they did that though, and failed to find any Allied unit, they'd perish in the desert. Moore and his men choose to head south. We'll find out what happens to them next time. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Despite being harassed by land, sea and air, Bertoldi's column takes Zeela on the 5th and pushes eastwards. 